Welcome to another episode of Bro History. Uh, it is Henry and Danny. Uh, we are finally back after, I guess, a bit of a hiatus. A little bit. Uh, but it's not really a hiatus. It's kind of like a morning. summer break. Yeah, kind of a summer break. This is being recorded on a Saturday evening. Um, it is 10.04 p.m. God damn. We are sacrificing our social lives mm-hmm. for this show at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been away for a while. I've been traveling. I've been in... Uh, I, I went to... Germany, I went to Italy, Britain, France, England, and Scotland. That's awesome. In Bush Gardens, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> I was in Virginia Beach. Um, so I know I'm from New York, but I actually lived in Virginia for a couple of years. My family all lives in Virginia Beach. And um, I went down with my girlfriend to uh, visit, and we went to Bush Gardens. And uh, Bush Gardens is. In my opinion, the best theme park in the world. Oh, really? I'm going to Six Flags on Monday, so I'll let you know. <laughs> it's better than. Well, have you been to Bush Gardens? How could you? Even I have in, in in Florida. It's different Bush Gardens, man. Well, different. Oh, Bush you know, there's Gardens, brother. there's a bunch of Six Flags. Is the that Florida? Are the Florida. Uh, I always right. stick up for New Jersey's Six Flags because they have King of Cod. It's the fastest, tallest roller coaster on the planet. It's kind of hard to hard to top that. They're building a new roller coaster at Bush Gardens that's supposed to be the heart the biggest and baddest one in the world but they have well, a pretty good repertoire totally get of roller coasters it. there <laughs> um it's kind of funny though because I found out that my girlfriend is scared of roller coasters while we were there <laughs> and did you, did you force her to go on yes I did I, she was not <laughs> happy so she was telling me that she really liked roller coasters on her way there so I was like okay let's like let's just plan our trip our trip there around going on roller coasters because i really enjoy them Mm -hmm. and we went on like a rainy day Mm -hmm. so on a rainy day the parks are usually empty and it's like perfect roller right you can just jump right in right yeah you can just jump right in and like there's some badass roller coasters in bush gardens they have the griffin which Mm -hmm. is basically one that like goes diagonal and shoots in the water it's just a really awesome roller coaster they have um um, Apollo's chariot, which is basically like nitro. It's, it's like a replica of nitro from, I love nitro. Yeah. yeah. It's like the same exact roller coaster. Um, they have some really sick roller coasters and like looking at the pictures of, uh, me and her, like I have my hands up and I'm smiling mm-hmm. and she's clutching she, for dear life. <laughs> she, you ever see that, that famous world war two photo of like this German boy, like cowering in fear and there's like a German soldier screaming at him. No, a very famous. It's a very famous world war two picture. Uh-huh. Um, she Type looked like that. that. That's what, that's <laughs> what it looked like. Like she looked like someone in war who was shivering. <laughs> and, um, I was, um, I mean, it's, it's whatever. I mean, I wanted to go on roller coasters like all day and like go mm-hmm. in the front seat and like right. all that shit. I had to go on some alone. Really? Yeah, there was one that went backwards. There was one that went backwards that Mm -hmm. that it was kind of cool. It rocked front and then it rocked backwards. Mm -hmm. Um, It was kind of like a boat, you know, the boat ride. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In roller coaster form. Oh, that's it was a cool concept. Like I've never been on something like that. And she was like, "I'm not doing that one. Screw that." (laughs) But it was uh, it was fun, man. I love I love uh, going down to see family, and I love I love I love parks. I love parks. Amusement parks. Want to come to park with me? So that was fun. Um, another, th- a funny thought about Bush Gardens that entered my mind while I was there was that the way the park is broken out is that it's all European countries. Yeah. As if you get the joke, like they have, it's like, like Epcot, Italy. you know. Yeah, it's like it's like an Epcot of only European countries. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I was like, what came to my mind was, I bet if I wrote some shitty article about how Bush Gardens is not inclusive or is not inclusive enough for other cultures, I bet it would go viral. (laughs) Bush Gardens is not inclusive. It only celebrates white European identity. (laughs) And I was thinking like, that would be so funny. Like if I I wrote a little troll article like that and it went viral, because next thing you would know, there would be people who would be agreeing with it. They'd be like, yeah, Bush Gardens should open up a uh, Senegal or something like you know, some, some uh, just a random country. Bahrain, and, uh, yeah, Bahrain. <laughs> uh, Bush people would start agreeing with that, and then there on the flip side, there'd be people like, "What the fuck? 
<laughs> what the fuck? The social justice warriors are out of control. <laughs> We're not changing Bush Gardens. And it reminded me of an article that I saw a couple of years ago. Um, when um, you guys know that we're closet dorks by this time, by, by at this point we're both. Uh, we're be, fully out of the closet. Let's be yeah, real. We're fully out of the closet. So the Mario game that came out on uh, Switch, Mario right. Odyssey, mm-hmm. love it. Ma- Mario can dress up into different characters, and right. he was able to dress up as as a Mexican, basically. Right. <laughs> yeah, sombrero <laughs> and all. Yeah, Mexican with a sombrero yeah. and a poncho. Yeah, and um, some fucking loser wrote an article like. This is culture appropriation. Mario's participating in culture appropriation because he has a sombrero on. And I was like, oh, my God. This guy is either the biggest loser on planet Earth or he's just a troll who's just starting the – he's just – he's funny. And he's he like – He good. has the right idea maybe. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to write some shitty article, put it on Twitter, and next thing you know, it will be a hashtag like Bush Gardens <laughs> – you know, upgrade, you know, white privilege bush gardens or something something like that. <laughs> and then it will be like a, a tag, like it will be like your front articles, like the internet's going crazy over bush gardens being not inclusive enough. So I thought, I thought, I thought about that, but I decided not to do it. Um, well, we just decided to just have talk about it in the show. <laughs> I decided not to do it because I have a life. Uh, <laughs> but also, uh, since we're still in the intro stage, so uh, two things I want to, I want to talk about um, bro history related. So we may or may not have a new logo at this time. Mm -hmm. Uh, We just finished our art commission from uh, a guy who's very talented. So you might see a new logo. So we're still the same people. Don't think that we disappeared. Um, And if it's not out by then, because you know, we're, we're going to make some adjustments and we're probably going to send it over to some of you guys who contact us frequently, who like give a lot of insight onto the show uh, for feedback and stuff like that. So It might be here. It might not be here. But if, you know, we shall see. This is our new logo, if it is. And then if not, then it's then really we'll dope. <laughs> it's super dope. Um, and then also uh, rate and review the podcast. Thanks, everyone, for, for rating and reviewing the show. Um, I, I uh, asked people to rate it. We were at 143 a co- like only like five days ago. And um, a bunch of people started rating it. And uh, we're at 150 now. So. Uh, people te- seem to rate the podcast more when we're closer to like a milestone number, like a number that's like divisible by 50 mm. I've noticed. So mm. like 150 is like, Oh yeah, like oh, let's get them at 150. But from 150 to like 200, it's going to be like, Oh, who gives a shit? But yeah, rate and review the podcast. That is a tremendous help to us. Um, it just, it really does help the show grow. Um, just looking at like stats and stuff on our side, the more ratings that you have, the more likely someone is a, is going to click on the actual show and be like, okay, people, this is a podcast with like a following. It must be pretty good. So rate and review the podcast. It's a tremendous help to us if you haven't already. If you're on Apple, I know most of you are half or probably less than half of you, like 40% of you guys are on other devices, but like rate and review the show. It does really help us tremendously. All right. Um, all that housekeeping stuff out of the way. Uh, Danny, what's going on, brother? Chilling, man, as per usual. I know that uh, we haven't done like a current events rundown in a little while and seeing as how we took a little bit of a break, I figured maybe we'll just run through a couple of topics today and just, uh, you know, have some back and forth bullshit session. Yeah, we're going to just, we're just going to talk a little bit out of our asses and see where this conversation goes. We have some, some different topics, but what's the first thing that you wanted to talk about? Because you kind of made the list of like our topics today. Sure. Uh, I think the first one I wanted to talk about, um, you know, let's get the uh, Middle East out of the way first, uh, is uh, just read a report um, from the Pentagon Inspector General uh, that they issued to Congress saying that uh, Islamic State or ISIS uh, is currently growing in power again. And um, it specifically calls out our president, um, you know, his decision to rapidly draw out of Syria um, and, you know, obviously pull out all that diplomatic staff from Iraq and things like that. Um, due to like uh, the Iranian threats and conflicts there. Uh, So uh, what's interesting about this is that, you know, it's changing the game a little bit. There's, according to the report, about 14,000 to 18,000 militants, uh, which is much, much smaller than what it used to be. Uh, But nevertheless, very, very dangerous. Um, They're doing their usual tricks, you know, like they're doing the assassinations, suicide bombings, 
crop burnings, ambushes, you name it. Um, but they're also uh, kind of extorting people. Uh, this is how they get their money. Um, so they'll, you know, extort communities. They'll extort uh, politicians. They sometimes uh, take, like, for rebuilding contracts, you know, when we do humanitarian aid to, to the areas that we blow up and we give them some money to <laughs> build their building again, sometimes they'll infiltrate the, you know, the systems that we do that with and they'll just start skimming money off of the top of those. And since it's, like, really decentralized, it's hard to tell, like, how much money they have or how much you know, they're actually acquiring, but, uh, it seems to be that they're switching from, you know, the, this giant, uh, you know, uh, region grabbing, you know, force, uh, you know, a caliphate building force, uh, to, uh, a more like Al Qaeda style insurgency, uh, which makes it quite, quite difficult, uh, you know, to root them out. Um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a interesting story. You know, uh, I know that we, both uh, are in uh, agreement that we should be pulling out of the different Middle Eastern wars, but um, I think I, I usually fall on the, the, the cautious side of pulling out uh, for this argument. And I thought that this, uh, you know, this news is pretty interesting, you know, because I was always wearily cautious about pulling out rapidly, you know, um, and it, it, it appears that, uh, you know, some of my fears were warranted. So I figured we'd talk about that for a little bit. So, I know what you're talking about. You're talking about that report that was re that was issued. Um, That's right. Was it from the State Department or who? What was the, the report? The Pentagon's know? Inspector General. The Pentagon's Inspector. I'll I'll be completely honest. I've been on a media fast for the past week or so, so oh, a lot of stuff good for you. <laughs> um, it's, it's very net. It's very necessary. Yeah. So I haven't read the report, but it sounds like the same story that we've been we've been really hearing over the past. Uh, since April, really, I think that's when the, the report that that's the timeline that it really tracks about how there's like an ISIS re, re reassure the ISIS Resurgence. is reemerging, mm -hmm. and it's due to Trump's rhetoric of saying that he wants to pull out of Syria. Right. Well, the, the inspector general did point out Trump's that decision, but there were also other other factors in play uh, for that as well. But I think like the headline is that Donald Trump did something stupid. Let's let's talk about it, you know, um, but that's kind of like what I wanted to get at, you know, like talking about, um, you know, our, our interventionism, uh, and, uh, you know, what, what the consequences are. And of course, now that we're in what the consequences are of pulling out. So figured we'd chat about that. So, I mean, it makes no real difference. ISIS is, all right, here's something that's really important to understand. So the caliphate is gone. You mentioned that you said that earlier. It's not the mm -hmm. same size. I said, right. Well, not even close. 16,000. The caliphate is not it does not exist anymore. It has right. been destroyed. Right. The only really stronghold that the jihadists have right now in Syria are is in northwestern Syria in a province called Idlib, which they probably will not have very much longer. There is a there is a there's really not that much ISIS up there, but there's a lot of Al Qaeda up there. Um, the caliphate, for all intents and purposes, is gone. Um, ISIS has largely been defeated. But here's the problem: the caliphate has been defeated. Here's the thing. ISIS is an ideology. Right. It's, it's anyone can pick up a rifle and say, hey, I'm ISIS. Right. Anyone right. can do that. So, yeah, you're going to have leftovers. And I'm sure there's a lot of ISIS. There's a lot of leftover ISIS from the caliphate who are in desert bunkers because, I mean, Syria, a lot of it's big desert. I mean, Eastern right. Syria is a big desert. Right. Um, a lot of them are probably just living off probably food surpluses that they've stored. I'm sure that there is some corrupt Syrian, uh, SA, um, Syrian RB guys who are giving them food, um, who are being paid off to give them food. Um, I'm sure that there's a way to sustain them, that, that, that they're sustaining themselves. So they're not going to go away. The, the only way that they're going to leave is through police action. Like, that, like police action has to take place for all these guys to go away. Or to be killed. And honestly, the U.S. has no fucking business like doing police action on ISIS in Syria. It has no fucking business doing it. Because honestly, you know who would actually kill every last ISIS motherfucker in that country? Bashir al-Assad and Vladimir Putin would kill every last one of them. <laughs> so let them do it. Let them just kill. Just let them deal with the remnants of ISIS and just get out of the hair. They've already I mean, proven uh, that they they've already proven in Aleppo that they have the ability to take on these like these very large intimidating bat like armies. They're about to they're about to liberate Idlib. Why even bother? And it's just it's just honestly just war propaganda. Um, it serves two purposes. It one purpose is to bash Trump. 
which which the MSNBC, CNBC, Washington Post, PBS News, which every single news, mainstream news outlets really has made their living off of over the past two years is to bash Trump whenever they want. And I'm not a Trump supporter, so I'm not saying this is a sycophant. Um, I criticize him harshly and I get more shit from Trump supporters than anyone else, which is kind of funny. Um, but it's, um, it, it's just convenient because the bash Trump. And then it's also convenient to justify troops. Like if there's always going to be an ISIS there, like there, there, cause there's going to be an ISIS there or some form of ISIS there or some form of jihadism. It's the fucking middle East. <laughs> like it's just baked into the cake at this point. Like there's been so much war there. There's been so much sectarian conflict that there's always going to be a insurgency of some sort. Um, especially when there's such a like divide between Sunni and, and everyone else. Uh, so I, I don't, it's, it's just, you don't need any more justifications to stay there. I'd say get the fuck out. Uh, the main justification right now is like, well, what about the Kurds? What about the Kurds? Listen, I, I'd like to talk about the Kurds, but like just to respond to a lot of that, you know, honestly, the first thing I'll say is that this is the Pentagon's inspector general. Uh, while I give you some credence in the fact that there could be some war propaganda going on there, um, at least uh, the, the specific calling out Donald Trump for that, you know, has a lot of military backing in general. You know, there's a lot of people who left, you know, uh, you know, post high posts because they disagreed with the strategy of pulling out. I think most people are in favor of not you know, continuing an endless war in the Middle East, especially, you know, folks in the Pentagon. But, um, but it's a matter of like how one does that, right? There's, there's strategic ways of pulling out that, you know, ensures the safety uh, and security of, of our troops, but also make sure that ensures the safety and stability of the region when you do pull out. And I think part of what the inspector general's report is pointing out is that the method by which they they decided to draw out and the rapidity, uh, you know, caused a situation where it allowed an insurgency to thrive and flourish. And, and again, I want to point out that, yeah, you're right. The caliphate as, as a caliphate is gone, right? Like it no longer exists and, you know, they have Idlib and that's about it. And they're about to lose that too. But, uh, the point though, have, is that they're, they don't have, the caliphate doesn't have <laughs> Idlib. Like they're different. They're, there's this different group. The guys in ISIS don't have Idlibs. They're totally different groups. I mean, they're not totally different groups. They have the same ideology, but right. they, those, guys, uh, those ISIS, ISIS guys, right. those ISIS guys were in the East of Syria and they're in a small place in Southern Syria right. on Al Tanf. So, so up in, the people up in Northern Syria are, they're like a collection of other jihadists that have been forced in. Uh, they were like kind of pushed in there by the Syrian army. Um, right. They got they, backed they, into a corner. Yeah, the, the, that's the, what they are. The, the, point, well, the point, though, is that, yeah, sure, Bashir al-Assad can go ahead and murder a bunch of ISIS people. Um, if they were a caliphate, they're, very qu they're quite good at fighting large-scale battles against them. Um, but it's now an insurgency, and that's kind of the, the difficulty. And it's no longer just in, in, um, in Syria. It's also picking up in Iraq, which we're pulling out of as well. Uh, and uh, a branch in Afghanistan is popping up now. It's uh, ISIS Khorasan or ISIS K, as they're uh, uh, basically calling themselves. And they're gaining ground in, in Afghanistan because they're basically like uh, militants that are uh, uh, kind of pissed off at the Taliban, uh, which is like the you know de facto uh, terrorist group in, in Afghanistan, uh, because they're acting more like a political entity and not like a jihadi one. Uh, so they're like upset at the way that they're like dealing with the U.S. and stuff like that for the drawdown. So they're like picking up uh, a lot of uh, uh, steam there. So this is like a very decentralized insurgency. And as we found out through our many, many wars of uh, attrition in the Middle East, uh, insurgencies are really, really hard to root out and they cause a whole lot of damage and, and a whole lot of issues. So while uh, Al-Assad might be pretty good at fucking killing you know, um, ISIS in, you know, in the open battlefield, I think he's going to have some trouble in Syria with insurgencies. And I think just the region in general will as well. Um, whether or not that has anything to do with, you know, our decisions to pull out of Syria in general, I think are, we, we can debate about, but, um, you know, basically I think that, that it's interesting to see how that group has decided to, uh, kind of reshift its priorities and its focus and, you know, what the impacts may be. Uh, because, you know, if they, when we pulled out of, uh, um, largely out of Iraq, you know, that's kind of the reason we left a vacuum, you know, and it's kind of the reason why ISIS started in the first place. So pulling out again, you know, there were, you know, insurgents in Iraq that became 
in Iraq and Syria that became ISIS when we pulled out, uh, or at least when we drew down heavily. Uh, and now there are insurgents again, you know, and the question is, are we creating another power vacuum, you know, and will it create another ISIS? So I disagree with a lot of what you just said. So <laughs> let me, I mean, it's cool. Let's let me, the let, show. Me, let me, let me unpack. So on, I, so I don't like that narrative that ISIS was solely created because of the power vacuum that the U S left in Iraq. Like I just don't really like it because it, it kind of insinuates that the U S should have indefinitely stayed in Iraq to make yeah. sure there was I'm, no I'm with you on that point. That, that yeah. ever, we, that we agree on that point. Place. And I don't think the same, if you're going to use this, the same, I'm not saying you, but I'm just saying like yeah. people in general, like if you're going to use the same rhetoric in Syria, like you can't leave Syria to prevent an insurgency in Syria. Like why would you want to, first of all, why would you want American troops to fight an, insur an ISIS insurgency? For, that's, for real. That's, like that's the worst possible thing I could think of. Right. Putting, putting American troops. Sounds like a, it's a terrible Sounds job. Like a nightmare. Right. I mean, only a couple of months, only about a month and a half ago, I, my timeline might be a little off, but it wasn't too long ago. When a truck full, of, I think four or five, uh, I don't know if there were guys in the army or Marines, but they were blown up from a car bomb from from some jihadist group. I think it was an ISIS group. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't want to put American soldiers in that line sure. of fire. I don't. They have no business fighting an insurgency in anywhere in the Middle East right now, especially in Syria. You have a government there who is going to kill every last jihadist there. Let them do it. It's none of our business. Like, but again, it's I, not it's really, not, I mean, that's, that's addressing the problem in Syria, but not in Iraq or not in Afghanistan. Well, where all right. Iraq has its own like strong men. Right now. No. <laughs> Iraq has its own problems right for, now. For real. Like it's, it's not. All right. So basically in Iraq, you have a, you had a country that was predominantly Shiite that was ran by Sunnis. Right. And then they switched, they flipped it on its head. So they flipped right. like when after the Iraq. And by they, you mean us. <laughs> the United States flipped it on its head. They, they, they put the Shiites in charge of the, of the, of the Sunnis. Of, of the majority Shiites. Mm -hmm. I mean, Iraq's majority is Shiite. Mm -hmm. But the Shiite government kind of, is kind of a Shiite chauvinist. So it just kind of, further spirals that like cycle of revenge killing and stuff like that, because the war, the, you know, that war in Syria, I think it's like that it's the Syrian war in Iraq war three, which is called, I, I mean, I really war consider three. it like Iraq war three, like the war in Mosul. And, and everyone knows that the third part of the trilogy is always the worst part. <laughs> I mean, that's like the same war, you know, mm. to, to me, it's like, it's always been like the same exact right. war. Uh, now you have a bunch of pissed off Shiites who are going to, who, who, I mean, I've heard stories about them just like anyone who's, it's, who's suspected of being ISIS or anyone who fought in like some militia, Sunni militia is being called ISIS and they're going around and they're killing them and their families and stuff like that. And it's just going to further, further, push that cycle of violence over and over again the u.s shouldn't have would even though they started the problem by removing saddam hussein as bad as he was um they the u.s should not be involved in any of this middle eastern revenge killing cycle and get the fuck out i mean it's a good point i mean it, it's hard to argue against because i'm with you you know like i, I don't i don't think and, and i know doing foreign intervention in general but um the big but, thing is the kurds like oh yeah, we yeah exactly the kurds like yeah, we gotta protect exactly. the kurds well, i mean that that is my opinion you know because we went in there we fucked shit up and then the kurds did a lot of fighting and get, they killed a lot of the, the terrorists right uh and and they did they did the very hard work on the ground uh and all they really want is to be like sovereign and and to to like be respected in the region. And, and I think that, you know, once we pull out, they don't have any, they don't have any real allies in the region, but I know that you wanted to talk about some, some updates on the Kurds there. So we can, we can go ahead and do that. I mean, I don't really have any real updates on, on the Kurds. Uh, I guess basically what's happening is that over the past couple of months, um, Trump, when Trump said that he was going to pull out of Syria uh, back in December, mm -hmm. It was after a phone call uh, with Erdogan and he was saying like, hey, um, we're here because of ISIS. Can you just kill the rest of ISIS? Mm 
<laughs> uh, this is exactly how the phone call went. Like I'm paraphrasing yeah. it a bit, but this was definitely a theme. No, it sounds like something Trump would say. He's like, <laughs> hey, we're here because of ISIS. Can you go kill ISIS? Can, can you just and, finish this up? And then they, Turkey was like, yeah, we can do it. It's like, all right, you kill them. And then we're going to go. <laughs> that's, that's basically what happened. Right. So after that, Turkey was like, all right, well, we're going to have to go invade Syria. <laughs> We're going to have to invade the northern part of Syria, which is the right. Kurdish zone. The northeastern part of Syria is Kurdish. Right. And the Kurds, you know, people who are sympathetic to the Kurds were like, oh, what the fuck? Because Turkey ethnically cleanses Turks. That's Kurds. Kurds, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Turds. Did I Tur say Turds? <laughs> I think you might have said Turds. I said Turds. Uh, they ethnically cleanse them. So <laughs> they're like, what the fuck? Um, this isn't going to be good. And. Now, the Kurds and the no, the Turkey and the U.S. have agreed on creating a buffer zone. It's like 18 miles long between like the Kurdish controlled zones and the Turkey controlled zones to prevent violence. Mm -hmm. uh, prior to that, there were some reports coming out, and I'm catching up on a lot of this stuff. I just want to keep you guys in mind that right. I've, been a, I've been on a media fast. Um, but like some of the articles I saw like four days ago mm -hmm. were written were like. Turkey is going to come at heads with U.S. troops in in uh, northeastern Syria. Like, oh no! Like, is the U.S. going to fight a NATO ally? Like, those are literally like the, the articles. That yeah, I that's saw. fucking like, stupid. Like, Turkey and the U.S. <laughs> are going to fight over the Kurds. Like, yeah, yeah no, right. Like, no. that would never happen. Like, no. are you kidding? If we're going to fight, it's going to be because they bought fucking S four hundreds and they're in bed with Russia. That's I, that's what we're. That gonna would say. be more likely, yeah. If there right. was going to be, if there was going to be a conflict between the U.S. and, and Turkey, it would be more something like that. It would be Russia based, basically, completely out of like U.S. influence type of stuff. They went too right. far astray, but right. U.S. doesn't give a fuck about the Kurds. In reality, like they well, use they use the, they use the Kurds as an army to take as over a pawn, Syria, basically, as right? A pawn. And honestly, it it spells out. And I want to do an ep We're gonna do an episode on this later. Um, I've been planning on doing an episode on this for a while, and I've, I've told some of you guys, but it's honestly a lot like World War I politics. Mm -hmm. And the British promised um, the Sharif of Mecca that they were going to be, uh, they were going to create like an independent, sovereign um, Arab state in the Middle East and Syria. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just going to let them go. But then the French were like, no, we want Syria. And they promised, like, they promised big chunks of land to both Syria, to, uh, to the Arabs and the French at the same time. So they just right. promised everyone. And they're like, well, you know what? Like, we can use the Arabs as an army against the Ottoman Empire. But in reality, like, we don't, the, our, like, our French ally is way more important than these Arabs. So I guess we're going to, we're just going to fuck them over in the long run. And that's basically what right. happens. And I think it kind of mirrors that. It, it definitely, it definitely does, you know, and, and that's, that's why I'm sympathetic uh, a bit towards the Kurds um, because I feel like, like we've, this has happened before, you know, like the point of like doing a history podcast in, in general is because we want to reflect on the historical record and see where there are parallels for today. And I think that's, that's a really good one that, to point out, you know, like, so how do we prevent something like that from happening again? Well, you know, here's the, here's my opinion on the Kurds. Like that, that thought of having a state, was so is so unrealistic to me like the fact like i don't think they could ever have a state mainly because if you take kurdistan like Kurd, you know the kurdistan and syria and iraq mm -hmm. you combine them together right they are landlocked they don't have that much natural resource like they don't no, have not that at all much oil like they have some oil like the oil in syria is located in the, Sir the syrian zones and it's I'm in the Kurdish zones. And it's funny because I actually saw this guy on Al Jazeera today. Uh, he was talking about how it's going to be U.S. policy to just land grab that whole northeastern area of, uh, of, of Syria just to prevent the Assad government from having access to the country's natural resources. And that's how, that's they're, going to that's gonna, that's how they're going to facilitate regime change there. And I thought that was just totally stupid because, like, they, there's the country they haven't had control of that area for years now. Like, they're yeah. still the government's still in control. Like, that's not going to push the regime over the edge. Right. Um, they're going to like have some. What's going to happen? I think in the long run is that they're going to keep on pressuring Syria to have some democratic election. 
mm-hmm. like over and over and over again, and then Assad's going to run again, and he'll win by like a landslide. Probably. That's like that's probably that's my prediction in the long run because right. the country's now more behind him than ever since after the war. Right. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's kind of hard to argue with the guy that kills the terrorists, you know. So it, it's it's hard to argue, and it's of course there's going to be. Like, I mean, he's a piece of shit, but like, I, I can totally somebody, see how people would, would get behind him. Uh, I was telling somebody that reason only. I was telling somebody the other day about Syria. Like, I was ta- having a conversation about Syria, mm-hmm. and they were like, "Well, you know, like th- this person was super pro Assad." The person I was talking to, mm-hmm. and that's something that I'm accused of a lot, which right. is funny. Uh, but I was what my take was, and what I was telling them was like, "Hey, listen, just because Assad is fighting the terrorist." And I agree that he's the better side in fighting the terrorist. Doesn't mean that that government was a ticking, wasn't a ticking time bomb. Right. That they have, they had, they had a, they had a system where problems, right? they had a, the, the system that the, the, the system they had in place basically was that they had a coalition of minorities. They had Alawites, the different Shiite groups and Christians mm-hmm. as like that upper class of, of, the country right, and the, the Sunnis sides. were in the minority and right. the Sunnis were 70% of the country. So it was a ticking time bomb. Well, like just when you have that type of divide, like right. it's going to be it, it's socioeconomic gonna, divides but basically. Here's right. Thing, but here's the thing though, like most of the people in Syrian army are actually Sunni. So it's not like just an all out sectarian war. It's most of the people who have Assad's back right now are actually Sunni. So, it's like way, just way more complicated, but that because of that divide, that war was able to take that war took place in the first place because there was a system like that. And you know what else is really interesting is that there's a lot in governments like in Syria, like you know, remnant basically, Syria was kind of like the way my perception of it has always been like it's a remnant of like the 1950s and the 60s, like Arab nationalism that's so pathetic to like. The, the Soviet Union type of government. Mm-hmm. And that's why the U.S. hates it so much. It's still, it's like the last remnant of like those Arab leaders that like those, po- those Arab populist leaders. Um, fuck. What was my goddamn f- point? Don't you hate that? <laughs> Losing your train of thought. Oh, so there's when governments like that, there's a lot of nepotism that takes place. Of course. So one of the reasons why the Syrian army had was losing so many battles in the beginning of the war was because they they were they had a nepotism policy in the actual army itself. Ah, so like if you, if you knew somebody, yeah, a lot of an officer, a lot of unqualified people were were had these big positions. Um, hmm. They had to reshape sure they that. Figured that part out. They, yeah. they had a, <laughs> when you're when you're in war, you have to reshape that because the Syrian army went from not really that good to really good. Well, yeah, throughout I mean, that war, like any army. Right. So they cut their teeth on like a bunch a, of terrorists. Like, so they, yeah. they kind of went through like, you know, an army that was riddled with nepotism and stuff like that to an army that was kind of like a, it's kind of like a blunt hammer. I think that would be the way to describe it. It's like mm-hmm. a blunt hammer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that, that a, is certainly how they operate. I mean, they, yeah. they, they killed a bunch of, uh, of civilians on their way to kill a bunch of terrorists too. So, you know, that's, it's a thing. Yeah. So. They killed, they've killed plenty of civilians and, it's that's that's war and uh um, right. obviously uh killing civilians should definitely be condemned right but it should be condemned when everyone does it not right. just one person equally, equally so right i can say this before the show why don't you yeah. tell tell everybody the stat so you, you should condemn whenever someone kills civilians it's you should condemn like it's it's wrong to collectively kill people just because they certainly live in a certain area right and i think a lot of the policy within Syria, like, you know, the Syrian nationalist uh, mentality right now is that let's just say all right, you're bombing Idlib right now. They haven't left Idlib since they haven't left Idlib. They're ter- they're, they're enemy they're combatants. enemies. Like they have, yeah. they know they should be back in Syria. You know, I think that's kind of the mentality mm-hmm. and I think it should be condemned. However, it should be condemned when the U S does it as well. So right. we, and I have, I didn't even see this, but so there was a, I think a world amnesty report, uh, listed the casualties from U.S., British, and French airstrikes in Raqqa. And Raqqa was the capital of ISIS. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was 1,400 civilians. That was the estimate. So it was probably more. Right. Um, that were killed during during the 
you know, when the like Kurds even at minimum you know, fourteen hundred people, that's an insane that's, amount of people. That's a really large number of people, and there's a lot of people who died in Mosul. There's a lot of people who died. Um, I, I did a podcast months ago on the U.S. Uh, you know, U.S. Co- coalition, and whenever you see hear the word U.S. coalition when you're reading stuff, it just means the SDF, the Kurds in Syria. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, they were dropping white phosphorus in a village. And like, yeah, white phosphorus is like that weapon that has that gray zone because you can use right. it for a lot of different things. Like you, you can use it for like, smoke. You can use yeah, it for it's, it's an illumination. Like lighting, yeah, lo- lighting up a, a, like a dark area. Yeah. It's an illumination tool first and they use it to like light up areas. But that still doesn't neg- neglect the fact that when white phosphorus falls down on a village, it's going to kill people. Like right, it's, it's going to it, yeah. not just kill people. It's going to burn them alive. Like right. it's a hideous death. Like it's, it's, it clogs your throat. It burns your skin. It's just like really a terrible, terrible weapon. And a bunch of like civilians died there. They're like women and children. So, um, it's just the consequence of war. And like, you should know that engaging in war is going to kill civilians and that's why you shouldn't do it in the first place. Like that's why you shouldn't engage in it. You know, I think this is a really good segue to talk about the other thing that you wanted to talk about with you yeah, get out of the Middle really East. Good, yeah. This is a really good segue. I'm going to yeah. pee real quick. So you're going to have to keep this podcast going right now. <laughs> All right. So uh, as usual, we went off on like a 30 minute tangent in the Middle East, even though when we started the show, we decided, Hey, let's not talk too much about the Middle East, but I mean, what are you going to do? It happens. Um, but not to ruin the surprise, um, but we're going to kick it over to uh, the East. Uh, so we're going to go to, to, to Asia and we're going to talk a little bit about um, specifically uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the uh, nuclear uh, fallout that, that happened there. We just uh, hit our anniversary. I think it was the 74th anniversary of uh, the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, um, which is kind of crazy, you know, because it's a, uh, it was a, obviously a huge event. It's the the one and only time in in human history where we have actually used uh, um, nuclear weapons or, or or atomic weapons. And uh, I think where this kind of leads into uh, from the conversation that we were having about civilian casualties is like, well, should should that have been allowed? Should we have done that in the first place? Did we really need to do that to win the war? And I think that's uh, kind of a fun. Uh, topic uh, to discuss as, as far as a segue goes from what we were already talking about. And it sounds like Henry is just now coming back into, uh, into view here. So um, let's give him another second. Stop talking shit. <laughs> Man, my, so, uh, my bladder is so weak. I, I know. <laughs> Should get that checked out. Um, you know, what's kind of funny though. It's pretty much every interview that uh, I've done has ended because I've had to pee. <laughs> <laughs> we should get you like a catheter. I need a, like a colostomy bag or something. I, <laughs> we should get you a cath. <laughs> um, colostomy bag? Do they take pee? No, I think that's poop. It's only poo. Yeah, you, you need a you need a catheter. Stick it in your uh, urethra and just just let it rip whenever you need to. What if I just peed in a water bottle like every single time I had to go? Dude, you do show? whatever you like. I can't. I mean, you could be not wearing pants right now for all I know. You know, so it's it's fine. So long as we don't hear it on the audio, go for it. Make right. it happen. Uh, so I, I ruined the surprise. Uh, I told everybody that we are going to be talking about the anniversary of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the question, of course, is, you know, um, when we're talking about civilian, civilian casualties, right, what – what bigger, uh, you know, uh, historical record do we have than, you know, the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and how we drop A-bombs on, on those two cities and completely leveled them because we wanted to win a war against Japan. So well, I'll let you kick it off. So I wanted to talk about this is I honestly, when this happened, I didn't even realize it was the anniversary. Mm-hmm. I didn't find out it was the anniversary. I didn't realize and put this together because I've been on a media fast. Right. <laughs> I'm going to blame anything I get wrong. On, on, media show, fast. on being on a media fast. So <laughs> someone's like, you got that totally. I'll be, well, I was on a media fast. Uh, <laughs> so, but I didn't realize it was the anniversary of the, of uh, the U S dropping nukes on Hiroshima and Nagasaki until like yesterday, the ninth. Mm-hmm. tenth today. Yeah. So ninth. Uh, and 
I've always found it a very interesting question. And I'll give you some backstory about why I'm interested in this. So when I was younger, people say that teachers are terrible. You know, <laughs> that's kind of like the common, like history. Who teachers, says that? <laughs> history, specifically history teachers are targeted. Like, oh, we didn't learn anything that's really necessary in history. I had a really good history teacher when mm-hmm. I was in middle school. I had a lot of good history teachers, and I think that's why I'm actually interested in it. Social so, studies for the win, right? Yeah, I had a good social studies teacher, and she uh, she brought this up in our classes on World War II, and she said that it's highly likely that the U.S. didn't need to drop a nuclear bomb on Japan. Mm-hmm that a lot of this narrative that we're reading in this, in this textbook about how the U S needs to drop the, they had to drop the bomb to stop the to Japanese stop empire mm-hmm. is, is, is debatable. Right. So, I think they were losing at that point pretty badly. Well, they were absolutely losing the war. Right. Your audio changed a little bit. Are you, uh, no. Okay. <clears throat> Let's just run through it. So my big question is that all right? I'm going to ask you first. So, Shoot. what's your general take on the atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Like, what do you think? It, let me. The better question would be: Do you think that the U.S. should apologize to Japan? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I do. Do you think the U.S. should be like, my bad, type of thing? Y- yeah, I think it, it was. Um, it was. I think. I'm, I'm finding some some trouble articulating this thought uh, because it is a tough uh, thing to, to talk about. Um, the, the Japanese Empire were fucked up, but we were really we were crushing them. Uh, we were really advancing on 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 their territories and, and really putting them down. And there was plenty of other conventional weapons that we could have used to, you know, um, to to beat them back. I think part of this was a a stunt. You know, like we were like, well, if we do this. It's not about beating Japan. It's about dominating the world, right? And it was about asserting a world power um, because the moment that we did that, a whole lot of people were like, yeah, United States, don't fuck with them, you know? Uh, and, it, and it served to be like a sudden, almost as much as it was a, a like a conventional weapon, like a nuclear weapon, it was also a psychological weapon, right? It put us on the world stage and it definitively said like, we are the superpower like we are the ones that that have this massive massive power um i i think that it was an absolute it it was it was fucked up i mean like when we look at things like uh, napalm or like cluster bombs or uh, uh gas attacks about bio warfare these are all things that we generally you know condemn right we we say you know that's fucked up that's a that's a really indiscriminate way to kill people you know it, it's it's effective to, to, you know, uh, break your enemy's morale, but it also kills lots and lots of people that had nothing to do with it. And I think that the, the nuclear bomb should be thrown into that same, that same camp. Um, you know, at the same time, uh, we've reaped the benefits of that, you know, today. Uh, I think an apology is, is the least we can do. I know it's the very least that you can do. The U.S. has yeah. never apologized for for dropping the nuclear bombs because that would be a very very big. It would be a blow to U.S. foreign policy in general if you mm-hmm. did that because you'd be like, well, U.S. foreign policy has always been like, yeah, people are going to die, but it's for the greater good type of thing. Mm-hmm. Apologizing that and saying, oh, that was a wrong choice would be an indictment on U.S. foreign policy in general. However, I don't want to go into this as like an anti-war activist or something like that, even mm-hmm. though I kind of am, I'll just be blunt uh, or transparent with you guys. But I want to like, just talk about this in like an objective manner to, to, to the most of our ability right. and lay out our biases as well. At least, right. You know, I'll lay out my bias. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm pretty much on the same page as you on your opinion. And uh, let's, let's just, I'm going to talk about the history real quick. Sure. So what happened is that, so two bombs were dropped. There's little boy was dropped first. Mm-hmm. And that was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6th in 1945. And fat man, the bigger of the bombs was dropped on Nagasaki on August 9th. Right. Fat man was actually, it was, 
it didn't have the same blast radius as little boy, but it was a bigger bomb. Right. The reason why it didn't have a bigger blast radius is because it landed in the mountains. So the mountains acted as a shield, but they both killed thousands, tens of thousands of people um, immediately incinerated them. So right. we're not even talking about the people who died of radiation poisoning and just a terrible, horrible death. Uh, between those two bombs, the estimate is anywhere between 135,000 to 300,000 people were killed. Right. And it's important to take note that most of those people were women and children. Right. Most because of the most, men, of the, most of the fighting men were out doing the fighting. Right? Most of the fighting men, exactly. Most of the men were fighting out doing the fighting. So my first question with these bombs is that how – what was the total effect of these bombs on the military? Like just because they were kind of random cities in, within Japan, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Not random cities totally, but uh, there are two thought, cities with majority civilian populations. Like how much did that affect the war, quite, the, the war effort? I thought that they were, uh, they were manufacturing something. I, I, I could be getting Nagasaki, this totally wrong. Nagasaki had, uh, I think, the, some manufacturing plants, but like, they weren't like highly strategic military targets or anything like that. They mm-hmm. were civilian population. They, they were civilian zones. Like, it's not like they hit the capital, you know? It's not like they hit all, they bombed a big military base, like a, like Norfolk, Virginia or something like right. where the Pacific fleet is or, right. or, or the Atlantic fleet is or San Diego where the Pacific fleet is like they bombed civilian zones. Like, yeah, like it's wartime. So, of course, there's going to like, be like why why those trees? Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to take note is that a lot more people died in Tokyo prior to the, the two bombs. So far more people died in Tokyo bombings. I think it's anywhere between. I mean, there's with these stats, there's you know you don't really know the true number because mm-hmm. both sides try to hide them for different right. propaganda purposes, like right, for different uh, reasons. Uh, the, like they, but they had the same goal, but for different reasons. Like right. the U.S. wants to say, "Oh, we didn't kill that many civilians." Right. And Japan obviously wants to like keep the morale going. It's like, oh, not that many people died, so yeah. come up with the same conclusions. But I've seen a million people. I've seen five hundred thousand. I've seen a lot of different figures of how. Many In any case, died it's just a, a, an inordinately large amount of people. I think I've saw because Tokyo is one of the biggest. Even at that time, was one of the largest cities in the world. Right. And we firebombed the shit out of it. And Tokyo wasn't just firebombed. It was obliterated off the right. map. Obliterated. Mm-hmm. 70% of that city, at the very least, was burnt to the ground. Right. But that was using conventional weapons, though. That was just using B-52 bombers and firebombs. And I forgot what they put in the bombs, but they made them more flammable. Right. They did Especially something. Like napalm or some shit. Not yeah, really napalm, something. but... Yeah. It, they did something with the bombs where the, f- the blast radius would, like, ignite into fire and burn down. It was terrible so that was going on they almost dropped bat bombs in on tokyo yeah they almost if dropped you remember bat yeah. bombs <laughs> we released dropped, that episode recently yeah, that shit is crazy they almost dropped bat bombs on japan which were essentially just nightmares like nightmare fuel seriously nightmare fuel the you know if you guys played gears of war those little things when you go out and fly dark, around fly yeah. around and kill you basically yeah. that but they blow up yeah they try to make that but it with, was like two with bats going to control it. But with yeah. bats, they tie bombs to bats and they would fly into, I guess, wooded areas, right? Because they would want like people's see roofs them. fucking flying under people's cars, like literally everywhere. They would just go everywhere and then blow up. Yeah. It, it was just a terrifying experience. Like imagine yeah. the last thing like a bat flies into your house and you're like, Oh no. Yeah. And now your house is on fire. Yeah. It's crazy. So, all right, so the U.S. was bombing them, uh, bombing Japan to shit, and Japan surrendered on August fifteenth. So it's almost about what five, six days after, yeah, six days after, days. six yeah. days after the U.S. dropped the second bomb in Nagasaki. So between that time, between when the U.S. Uh, dropped the two bombs and Japan surrender, there's another factor, and this is usually the factor that's used on the like the U like Japan did not was going to surrender uh, anyway. They mm-hmm. surrendered after the Soviet Union declared war on them. Right, because they were like, well, we can't hold up a second front. We're not, we're not Hitler. <laughs> yeah. we, can't, we can't do that. 
So the general rational, like how people rationalize the, the, the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, it, it's, it's a pretty simple argument, is that nuking Japan saved American lives by ending the war before an invasion took place. Right. That's like the, the I think the estimate that they usually throw around is that half a million American soldiers were going to die if they actually invaded Japan, and then they also throw in, I mean, if they did invade Japan, it probably would be a big number like that. And right. honestly, probably if that war prolonged, let's just say for another year, a, pr- a larger civilian population would have died in the long run because there would have been more cities that maybe they weren't nuclear bombed, but there would have been firebombed. You know what I mean? Right. Right. So I mean, that's typically the argument is that way more people would have died just because of the prolonged warfare and it had to come to a swift end. So that makes sense that you'd want to do it to save American lives and you're doing it for the greater good. You know, you're, you're bombing you're, you're, it's like a surgery type of thing. Like, Oh, I'm going to, we're going to just, you're just going to amputate work. your leg because it's got gangrene. But I don't, I don't know if I completely buy that, if I buy that narrative. That's the history book narrative, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. that's like the Truman traditionalist narrative right. that mm-hmm. we did. We bombed those countries. We bombed those countries. We bombed those cities in order to save the most amount of lives, not just American soldiers, but civilians included. Mm-hmm. Um, what people don't really talk about is that so Russia was going to invade Japan. They agreed to invade Japan a lot earlier before they declared war on them. But they just had to – what Russia had to do is that they had to win the war in Germany. Before the East, they can move right, on. Before they, they – their, their basic agreement, it was in 1943 that they agreed that after Germany was defeated, they would join the war in the Pacific. And the U.S. knew this. And – what the U.S. didn't want was Japan to end up like East Germany. Mm-hmm. I think that's the major reason is because they didn't want Japan to have an East, like a, a North and a South, like right. a like a, an North American South, zone, right. an American zone, and like a Soviet influence zone. So I think that's like the number one reason they just didn't want to have that type of dynamic. And the only I mean, way hindsight being twenty twenty, Japan is very very prosperous now. And it's largely in part because we took complete control over Japan and its and its economy and its resources. Um, but in, I, hindsight, I, in hindsight, Japan is in a very good position right now. Right. There's no arguing that Japan is pro- is 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 one of the most prosperous countries in the world. They have a they just they're 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 the leaders in the innovation of technology and cars, electronics. You name so it. many different industries. Just you right. name the industry that they're a leader in it. Uh, they did this without having natural resources as well. Right. Um, but I think a lot of it has to do with Japan having like six day work days and like yeah, they have a very strong working culture. Yeah, they, they have an entrepreneurial baked, mindset too. It's baked into their their culture right. how they why they're so successful. Um, obviously, all the foreign aid helped after oh, the war. Sure. Yeah. But what's interesting is that here's a big argument that comes from the people who are like, all right, listen, the war, like those bombs are bullshit. We didn't need to do it. Is that Japan was going to surrender pro like Japan was going to surrender in a matter of days. And I kind of, I actually do believe that like Japan was going to surrender at some point before those, before an invasion took place. Because like what people don't realize is that Japan, I'm going to peel this back a little bit. So during World War II, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor primarily because the U.S. put an oil embargo on them. Right. Japan was also, at the same time, Japan was in a war with China. They were in a conquest. They were con- they, Japan, the Japanese empire was a terrible, terrible government, right. by the way. Right. Like, I, let's not wash away the sins of the Japanese empire. Right. One of the main... Possibly, the rape of Nanking comes the, to mind. The war crimes yeah. from the Japanese Empire are comparable to the Mongolians. Like that's how they, yeah, they were, yeah, mur- murderous government, mm-hmm. murderous. Right. They sack cities, murderous, rape racist. the women, yeah, indiscriminately kill civilians. 
uh, chop off heads. Like the stories from like Japanese conquests in China, they're equivalent to right. something that you would read out of like Medieval Genghis times Khan's stuff, diaries. Yeah, exactly. Like they were just absolutely horrible. It if would make sport of it too. They'd be like, oh, go out and kill a bunch of people and bring me back their scalps and shit. It's fucking ab- abhorrent with, with beyond, beyond abhorrent. Sirens. <laughs> we can never avoid them. Yeah, so Japan was a ter- was a terrible system, terrible, terrible government. They had like secret thought police type things going on, and like it just wasn't a good system. So there's no whitewashing that. And so they attacked Pearl Harbor in order to, because the U.S. put an oil embargo on them and their main, what, what guys like Tojo were saying, and I forget if it was Tojo who said this, and Tojo was the prime minister of Japan during the war. And a lot of the blame of like a lot of the Japanese imperialism is put on to- Tojo, but Tojo kind of represented the popular sentiment that was in like the Japanese military because the Japanese military really ran the country at that point. Mm -hmm. So Tojo was just kind of like a representation, like a, like a populist view of the military. Like he, he was that type of guy. He wasn't like a Hitler type of guy. He was like larger than life type of figure. Um, He just represented that, like those hardline military, uh, military guys in the Japanese, in the Japanese army. So they basically advised the emperor that we needed to go to war with the United States. It was, it was inevitable. And in the long run, we would lose the war if the war was prolonged. Like they would advise them that. They were like, hey, listen, the United States is huge. They, are, they're, they have a much bigger population. Their industrial strength is 10 times larger than that of the Japan. Right. We, we need to do this in a surgical way. We need to go out and we need to, we need to destroy the Pacific fleet real quick. And we need to take over some, some key strategic zones in the Pacific, like some U.S. bases. But once we do that, once we, we neutralize and freeze their, their, uh, their military their leverage, assets, right. their, their military assets on the Pacific, in the Pacific, then we'll be able to go to victory. So that's what like, that was like the major sentiment, but it was like, they were highly skeptical about going to war. It wasn't like complete popular opinion. Like, Oh, let's go to war with the United States. Right. They really had to sell it to the emperor. You hear that? No, they had to sell it to the emperor and they had to use their own war propaganda to do it. They had to use. So when the war started, they obviously, I mean, like Pearl Harbor was, a success to them at the time and Japan was actually, they had a series of victories in the beginning of the war. So obviously Pearl Harbor, um, they invaded Burma. They kicked the British out of Burma. They uh, took over the Philippines. They had a series of really big wins that contributed to Japanese nationalism and like, Oh, we're going to win this war. We're going to win this war type of thing. Mm-hmm. By 1943 or 19, I think the big battle point, the, the big turning point that everyone uses for the war in the Pacific is the battle of Midway. Mm-hmm. When the U S took that like small little like dust of sand Island, <laughs> yeah. trip, which is like two miles long. But I mean, wherever the war, the I, I'm not a military strategist, so I can't tell you the exact turning point of the war, but that, it, it, by 1942, that was the Battle of Midway was like the summer of 1942. So six months or so into the war, uh, the war was like effectively like just completely swinging on the side of the U.S. By 1944, like once the U.S. Took and then they went like, island hopping, right? Basically yeah. kicking them out of every single little yeah strand of exactly sand. that's exactly what happened yeah. the u.s just went island hopping and just started kicking the japanese out of every single island in the pacific mm-hmm. once they took saipan it was like the writing was on the wall like even right. within the japanese government they were like right. all right this war is not like, like we're fucked. kind of done right um a lot of that a lot of that was probably hard to swallow for a lot of Japanese nationalists because they were winning so many battles in the beginning of the war and it just right. fit into their ideology of like, oh, Japan is the best. Right. But they started losing. By 1944, battle of Saipan, they lost about 70,000 soldiers. And that's a huge amount of soldiers in a battle. Um, also, the, the big battle 
that like really nailed it on the uh, that uh, sealed the deal was the Battle of the Philippine Sea, which is like famously known as the I think it's called the Turkey Trot or the Turkey Trot. It's called the um, I gotta look this up real quick. It's called there's like a funny name for it because it was so lopsided. Uh, the Battle of the Philippine Sea. The first day of the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Uh, 1944 was dubbed by the Amer- the the Great Marinus Turkey Shoot. Turkey Shoot. Yeah, because it was like shooting first, turkey. It was like shooting turkey. Was, uh, 350 Imperial Japanese planes were shot down, while the U.S. only lost 30 planes. So it right. was just very very lopsided. And it, the Pacific fleet, the, the Japanese, like the remaining like large operational fleet, was completely sunk in that battle. Um, it's kind of funny when you look at like Japanese stats in World War II, you'll, they'll list the casualty numbers. And it'll be mm-hmm. like, oh, 10,000 died, uh, you know, 6,000 were wounded, 2,000 died of disease, and like 7,000 died of suicide. <laughs> <laughs> You're not used to seeing that number. It's like, oh, okay. Well, because so, it was part, like, seppuku was a thing, you know, if they felt disgraced, did they. Seppuku? Rather... Yeah, dude. It's like a samurai culture. It's like uh, if you feel disgraced or dishonored, in order to regain your honor, you were supposed to like stab yourself in the stomach, and some other guy chops your head off, and then like you're good. Yeah, that's honor, basically honor suicide. Basically, I know it's kind of it was a common thing. Like when a when a, like a general would retire, they they'd just be like, "Well, I guess I'll go kill myself," even if he didn't retire on bad terms. Like, oh well, I guess it's like I'm, I'm just old, you know. I'm, I'm, I'll kill I'm myself. Done. They, they had a very, 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 uh, um, it was even glorified to do so. It was like, yeah, he lost, but you know what? He died with honor. It's like, what? He stabbed himself in the stomach and somebody else chopped his head off. Like, that's not honorable. Speaking, that's- of, pe- speaking of people who killed themselves. Oh, let's not talk about Je- uh, Mr. Epstein. All right. Yeah, yeah. let's not talk too much, but um, Jeffrey Epstein, may you rot in hell. <laughs> I'll just say that. There was no honor in that suicide. Let's just put it yeah. That let's way. just say. Let's just say that. Um, fuck that guy. Seriously. And the only my only regret about that thing is that he didn't have time to squeal. Yeah. On everyone involved in his disgusting pedo ring. My but, my my uh, regret is that the victims don't get their time in court and they don't get to like you know. Really I know that's the justice. That's it, that's the fucked up part. It's that's fu- what it's really a, it makes me upset. It's a fucked up. It's totally fucked up. It's also fucked up that a lot of the people that he would have squealed on are going to get away with it. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I, well, I mean, it doesn't get rid of the data. There was like a report that came out not too long ago that that's really damning on a lot of people and they'll have yeah, to yeah, investigate yeah. that, but they just lost their key witness, you know? So it's like the person, you know, it just makes it harder. Hopefully justice will be served, but like, honestly, that, that was a whole fucked up situation. So, all right, let's not get, to, we'll get on. completely sidetracked if we go yeah. more into this. All right. So, um, but for all intents and purposes, the, the war was over by like 1944. Uh, Tojo was ousted. So Tojo was forced to resign. And here's where the, the, you know, the U.S. was evil for doing this argument comes. That the Japanese were trying to surrender within that time frame of when Tojo stepped down and when the U.S. dropped nuclear bombs. Now, here's the thing. I generally agree with like the the Japanese would have eventually surrendered. I can't find the source of that. Like I can't like I've looked for it. Mm. Like, maybe someone can help me out with this if you know that where that source is. Mm-hmm. Because I think the source comes from Harry Truman. Harry Truman wrote in his diary that there was an intercepted um, telegram. Mm-hmm. Cables, from, basically, yeah, yeah, from a cable that said that the Japanese were about to surrender. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, that's used as like the main source, but I've never, I think that source exists from his diary, but I don't know of like any firsthand accounts of that existing. Yeah. So that's I, that's why I, I f- want to know. I want mm-hmm. to find that source. If it's true, if there's yeah. like hard evidence, the Japanese put in um, terms to surrender between before the bomb was dropped, because that would just be very interesting. It'd be compelling really. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's also like, even if they didn't, 
put in terms of surrender before yeah. those bombs got dropped. I think, like you said, the writing was already on the walls that they were they were losing, right? And you know, looking back at it, like if we wanted to have a similar effect, I feel like I don't know. It's hard to be in the position to say, okay, go ahead and drop the bomb. But I feel like I would be like, drop that shit in the ocean, real close to the, uh, you know, real close to the beach, and be like, the next one hits Tokyo. I know if you're you going to use it, like, like shoot a gun in the air, right? Right. Like, like a warning shot, but like show them, show them that we, you have the gun, right? Fine. You know, you want to, you want to, you know, play the superiority route. Like I think it would have a pretty similar effect if you blew up like a random field, you, they like could a giant have rice a, patty or some shit like that, you know, that has no people in it, you know, they could have blown up a military target. Like yeah, why not that, just use the bomb in Okinawa or something like that? Exactly. And that would have been, been able to see that. I mean, you'd still probably kill a whole lot of civilians anyway, which is no, it would the point be, that I'm obviously, trying to get around. Right. Like I'm trying to get around all the unnecessary civilian death, but if you were going to hit a populated area, it might as well be a, a military target. I'm saying I would have, I would have placed it right offshore uh of tokyo you know close enough where everyone can see it but far enough where no one has to die or like very few people would die if that and then just be like hey the next one next one's uh next here's the thing though is that like jap the japanese propaganda machine at that time would have been like oh that was one of ours (laughs) you know like you wouldn't have been able to sell that to them well you know we we did do a whole lot of leaflet dropping in in world war ii both in in the pacific and in and in uh um uh, Europe, but you know, could have easily just followed up the bomb with uh, leaflets. The g- all right, like, hey, we're about to drop the biggest fucking bomb you've ever seen offshore. Dan, Dan Carlin does an amazing podcast on this mm-hmm. from Hardcore History. Right, he did. He just released his second episode on the on the Pacific War. I haven't listened to that one yet, but his first one, the first episode, is really good. He did another one on nuclear bombs. Mm-hmm. He does a great job spelling that out as well. Mm-hmm. But on the Japanese Pacific Theater one he does, he does one on – he starts it out by telling the story of a Japanese officer in the Philippines or a Japanese soldier in the Philippines. The one that was in the jungle? Who didn't surrender until like yeah. 1974 or 76. Yeah. And yeah, he that's... thought that the newspaper – that he would find newspapers of like the war's over – and he thought it was just enemy propaganda. So I don't know if like blowing up a target outside of Japan would have had an effect on the civilian population. I don't know. Like we're to, so we're, we're we may be a little bit desensitized to like the the sight of a nuclear bomb because we've seen it in in you know film and media, video games, shit like that. But you got to think about the time, right? No one had ever seen something like that. You put that. I mean, like nuclear, an, uh, an atomic blast like that, especially if you did it in the water, like all the water that would spray up and shit, like the, it would be massive and you wouldn't be able to ignore it. Well, like, the, blast, the blast from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they weren't like the nukes that we have now. Right. Like the, course, nukes but that we still... have, the nukes that we were testing in like the 50s and 60s were... Yeah, they're, they're like way weaker than A thousand times now. larger? A thousand times larger? Mm-hmm. Bar Zamba, bar, like the the biggest nuclear bomb ever detonated. Ba- Zar Bomba, Bar Zamba, Bar Bar Zamba, Bar, bar Zamba, Zar Bomba, Zar Bomba was like the biggest bomb ever. It was like it right. exploded in like Siberia or something. Right, like that. It's, it was. It's a monster. Right. If you look at that, if you look at videos of that, you're like, I cannot believe that humankind was able to artificially create a blast like that. I'm just saying. Oh, I think. Hell. I think if you. Out. Like they have scientists and shit. Like like they weren't just willy nilly dropping bombs. They know exactly what the blast rate is. They know exactly what the impact like was. You just kind of park it offshore, or like maybe on on land, but not in a civilian area, and just be like, hey. But the we, blast we missed radius, on purpose. <laughs> the blast radius of those bombs. I don't think. I'm not sure about this, dude. It vaporized an entire city. I it think, vaporized an entire city. I, I think you can park one off off. How far would you have to go off Tokyo, though, for them to see it? I, I don't know. I don't know. But I, I, I'm sure that they would know. But I'm sure they could have known exactly how far they could have parked it offshore so that everybody if sees take, it. If you take that, you ever go on that website where you can look at yes, bombs, Yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh. radius? Uh-huh. Yeah. The bomb, here, are, I think Little Boy or Fat Man. I mean, they're both roughly the same size. Fat Man was bigger, but just didn't have the same bass blast radius because where... The topography, right? Yeah. They're about they 
would blow up Times Square in New York, but like they wouldn't destroy all of Manhattan. They would destroy like right, but Midtown, we're talking to, yeah, but that's Midtown, still a giant fucking that's ball, huge. You know? Yeah, you're right. And like thinking about that, I'm trying to think how far you would have to be like in New York, it's a mile offshore or something like that. Like mad close, close enough to be like, could oh shit. That, could you see that from like Center, New Jersey? Hell yeah. Hell yeah, yeah. You definitely would be able to see in, it. In, in Elizabeth, where I'm from, I see like when every time it's like the 9-11 like anniversary or whatever, and you see like the Twin Tower lights, like I can see that from my house. And we're in New Jersey, like in New yeah, Jersey. Yeah, that might be one of the dumbest things I've said. Um, I wonder how far though you could you would have to go. Yeah, I bet you can probably park one like between one and five miles offshore and everybody would see it. As a matter of fact, they'd probably get concussion. Like probably the, you know, windows would have like tons of windows would break, you know, maybe even some structural damage on the immediate coast, you know, maybe a small tidal wave, you know, <laughs> like I, I see all of those things as a possibility. Um, but I mean, I think the effect would be pretty astounding. Like, Hey, that was a big fucking bomb. Yeah. Oh, you, know, shit. you just drop. Like you, you same plane, right? One of them drops the bomb. The other one drops a bunch of leaflets and says like, Hey, the U S did this. The next one's like going right up the emperor's ass, you know, like this one's going up your backside. Yep. And then I, th- I feel like it would have the same effect. Although, you know, with that being said, we did drop them like several days apart and Japan didn't like surrender in between them. So I guess an argument could be made that putting one offshore wouldn't have done anything. I don't know. Well, Emperor Hir- Hirohito, when he was surrendering, the address that was played, I think it was on CBS News, was that they're surrendering because of the bomb. They're like, oh, we saw a bomb that we, it's just a totally different animal. That was kind of like the, the, uh, the crux of his little surrender speech. But then like a couple of days later, he said that they surrendered because Russia entered the war. So I don't think you could take that as like evidence. It's right. honestly both, you know, like, yeah, it's so a combination of it's things. It's a combination yeah. of things. It's not one or other thing. It's, it's yeah. All right. So two of your cities got vaporized. Now the Russians are in the war. We have to surrender. Yeah. It's I mean, that- Russians entering the war was just more like an insult to injury. You know, it's, it's like, Oh shit. Well, they right. they tried to get they wanted Russia to before they surrendered they wanted Russia to mediate a peace deal with between the U.S. and, and Japan, but mm-hmm. they wanted to keep a lot of their assets that they kept, mm-hmm. and the U.S. didn't accept it. They're like, you can't keep any of that stuff in, in the empire. Like you you're you're restricted to the island. So that was like the big argument that they were having. And there's also like a bunch of islands that Japan and Russia still dispute over till today. Like I think they're technically still at war with each other. Really? Te- yeah, like technically speaking, I don't think they've ever ended the war. Yeah, there's that a bunch of like been, super to, northern Japanese islands. To the are- imperialist. Oh, here's here's of all defend the imperialist. <laughs> that would have been fucking awful if the Soviet Union took half of Japan. Like well, imagine yeah, I mean, if there was a, Germany and if there was an the east and west to- Tokyo. It'd be like north, north and north, south Tokyo. North and south Tokyo or whatever right. equivalent right. you would have. That would be a fucking nightmare. Yeah. And that would communist suck. Japan. That'd be an communist? interesting book to read to read. Like a like alternate a, history. An alternate history of communist Japan. Yeah. I mean basically you ever read uh, Philip K. Dick's um uh, uh Man in the High Castle or watched the show? I haven't watched the show. It's really good. I recommend it. It's very interesting. I've been told that. I've been told that. All right. So all right, my, my general opinion is that Japan would have surrendered regardless of the bomb being dropped in the U.S. I'm, honestly, your opinion is basically my opinion. The mm-hmm. U.S. did the the U.S. did it to show the Soviets, like, hey, listen, like we have nukes, we just used them twice. <laughs> we'll use them on you, right? Because back off, <laughs> back off. Because at the same time, you got to look at the politics in Europe at the time, like the Soviet, the Red Army. There's debate over this, and I honestly don't know the answer of this because I'm not a World War II historian, but it's popular sentiment that the Red Army would have just like walked on the other walked to the Atlantic if they if they wanted to. If they wanted to. I don't I'm not convinced of that, to be completely honest. But 
that's like a common take is that the Soviet army would have walked over the allied army or the remainder of the allied army in Western Europe. Um, I think it would have been just a really bloody war, but it wouldn't have been like a total on top of another, uh, like on the, on the heels of another bloody war. That's like the other take that, you know, Oh, well we, even if they were going to surrender, we had to show the Soviets that we would murder civilians <laughs> <laughs> that were willing to murder tens of thousands like, of civilians it's just like because. if you're ro- if you're like robbing a bank and you're Not like want to show that you're serious like we gotta start killing hostages yeah like come on yeah we gotta show that we're serious we're gonna gun a hostage down every hour and like no it's more like we're gonna we gotta show they're serious we're gonna kill everyone but the thing is though is that at the end of the day like when you're having these arguments you're still justifying imperialism you know like yeah why does the U.S. need to control Europe? It's a good question. Like, that's the question. Well, because it's more democratic. <laughs> we control it. Because America. Because, listen, if the Red Army went there, then they'd all be raped. And they'd all be communists and standing in bread lines everywhere. But <laughs> kind of like the take. Yeah. It's a tough uh, question, man. Tough question. It's a tough question, the balance of imperialism versus non-interventionism because it's very easy to bend your 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 morals for things that you don't like i mean even socialists were were talking about like intervention in venezuela because they didn't do socialism the right way <laughs> like, like, <laughs> they're doing it wrong <laughs> they're doing it wrong it's gotta be more <laughs> that's not real socialism <laughs> that's always the argument with socialists it's like when a country fails of socialism they you're like well that's not real socialism <laughs> <laughs> like with Vietnam, and especially with like Stalin, because well, I, I mean, communism say, in general. I will, I will say I, that I kind of agree with that for for communism because uh, like Marx and Engels didn't intend for any of that shit. So I, I will say is that it's the straw man of like the left winger, mm-hmm. the typical left winger and the typical right winger. They both have straw men, right? And the straw man for like the right winger is always like, well, America is going to be like. Stalinist Soviet Union, and then the right winger, the the left winger straw man, when they're criticizing the right, is always like, "Well, it's going to be like a fasc- neo fascist uh, Hitler type country." <laughs> so yeah. I just find it both funny because yeah. both of those countries were very, very different. <laughs> so like, they're not. I don't yeah. think the U.S. is at risk of becoming either Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia. Not, not, not by any stretch. Not yeah. by any stretch. Despite what some. By, b- both sides are guilty of it. So if we're gonna be, if we're gonna be anything, we're gonna be our own thing. And, yeah, you it's know, gonna be like, like American fashion. Like some kind of years from now, they're gonna be like, yeah, those fucking weird ass American like insert word. Yeah, like um, it will be like its own taboo word. Like it will be yeah. like some some word that Demo- we associate with America. democracy. It's democracy. <laughs> Those democracists. <laughs> it, it will be, yeah. I, I, that's a really, that's a really good point. Like, if yeah. America ever like goes into that spiral of becoming a just a monster state, like something out of the Soviet Union or, mm-hmm. or Nazi Germany, it will be right. its own. It's it's it will, be its own thing. It will be its own thing that will be used to condemn other countries <laughs> in the future of that, like a hundred years from when, like that as, government as, falls as pretenses for war. <laughs> right. Oh, you're gonna be like. The American like, democracists. The American democracists. Yeah. <laughs> He's the new fill in the blank president. He's the new Donald Trump. Just because of president. <laughs> Even yeah. though there'll probably be some somebody who's worse that turns the U.S. into like a into the democracists into the into the democracists. All right, let's wrap that conversation up and wrap this up with the cool. two things that we found interesting that we haven't had time to speak about yet. So, hot, steamy love oh, yeah. is taking place. Oh, yeah. So, here's something. Here's a nice piece of shit. <laughs> so, new relationship, new power couple of the world. Mohammed bin Salman. And none other than. Lindsay Lohan. <laughs> this, apparently, is, this is the thing. Yeah. There, apparently, there's a secret relationship going on. Yeah. They're texting each other. They're, they're, texting, they're like each sexting other. each other. They've met, confirmed to meet once. They met like in- In Dubai at an Dubai. F1. Yeah, F1 race. 
Mm-hmm. I'm on mute. Yeah, so they, they met in um, in Dubai on an F1 race, at an F1 race, and evidently um, Lindsay Lohan is partly based out of Dubai now. Like, that's, like, her, her residence. She, like, lives there now. Uh, and she's very uh, well-known among, like, socialites and people in, in Dubai. Uh, and apparently Mohammed bin Salman has caught her eye, or she caught his. I don't know. I don't know how those relationships work. Um but obviously, Mohammed bin Salman's married to some princess, right? They have like kids and shit. Although no one's ever seen her, so she might not not be real or something like that. Like I've heard some some like juicy gossip rumors that she's not real. Um, she's most definitely real. Uh, and evidently, like s- people close to the situation have said that they have seen her exchanging text messages with him, and the rumors going around that he gifted her like a credit card to use that she can use to like buy shit. And obviously, Lindsay Lohan's like publicists have come out and denied it very strongly. But I think it's, I think it's, uh, these are one of those like bro history moments where I'm like, yeah, I believe this. This is a thing. You want to believe it? <laughs> yeah, I want to believe it because it's hilarious. I know. I want to believe it as well because it is the funniest story. I heard that she went Muslim. Really? Yeah, I don't. She's not been doing well lately. Sorry, man. I don't follow Lizzie Lohan. I mean, not because she, like she I became a Muslim, to. but like, honestly, like she was in, there was this one video that went viral a little while ago where she was in Russia and she was like talking with a fake accent and like try to, went up to like this homeless family and try to like steal her, their, the child. Did you see this? Yeah, I heard about that. It was like, I oh, just, do you want to come to my room and like have chocolates? You want chocolates or some shit like that, dude? It was super weird. And then she had this show for a minute where she had a, uh, uh, like a resort or a club or some shit like that in Mykonos. And then she, she was, there was this like dance move that she did where she flips her hair and looks like the most unsexy, but very like choreographed dance that she did. Like she's not been doing well. Like ever she's since she ran over that person, well. ever, ever since she ran that person over in New York and got away with it. When was uh, that? Oh, that was a while ago. That was like many years ago. Lindsay Lohan. All right, I'll give you some. I'll give you some inside scoop. So Lindsay Lohan. I know a lot of people who know Lindsay Lohan. Really? Yeah. So we should get her on the show. She's from Long Island. (laughs) Long guy land. Long. She's from Long Island. Um, I'm from. I'm from a place called Bayside, Queens, which is not far on. Which is like on the border of Queens and Long Island. Mm -hmm. So I just know she's she's two years older than me. Or two or three years older she's than three. me. Uh, yeah, she's well, she's be- three years older than me. I think she's thirty three. I'm thirty, so we're we're thirty. So she's three years older. Than I think us. you're 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 a year older than me, though. Right? I'm about to be thirty one. Okay, so all right, she's older than us, only by a couple of years though. She had she went to my college once. She was visiting her friend who went to my school, mm-hmm. and she was funneling wine. Funneling, yeah. Mm. it was very weird that's awesome she was funneling wine i party with her once but i don't know <laughs> no she's like a crack whore like she's uh, a that's a little that's a little intense let's just say that she is not a um she's not classy not put together she has mental problems yeah she has uh she's a complete mess it's crazy because I, I was watching the parent trap like today to to like look at her as a child actress and just be like you're going to grow up to be Mohammed bin Salman's side hoe. Like <laughs> the most powerful man in the Arabian Peninsula. <laughs> You're going to be his side piece. Yeah. It's that's, it's really funny. That's what happens when you're a child actor, you get fucked mm-hmm. up in the head. Yeah. Her dad's fucked up too, though. His, her dad is like in and out of jail for like different things. Like he mm-hmm. like gets in the fight to bars and like, really? gets into road rage and like will get out of his car and like fight somebody for something for like cutting him off. Uh, she comes from a very, very weird. She, she, all right. It's what happens when you take long Island trash and you throw them in Hollywood at a young age. That's yeah, there is like lots of money you get yeah. with lots of money. You get a Coke whore. You got to stop Who, saying that, man. <laughs> what? She does cocaine. Let's okay. separate that from the horror. <laughs> she, you get a girl who has some very bad drug problems and loose yeah. morals. Yeah. Who looks like she could be sleeping on a boardwalk in Atlantic City. <laughs> All right. 
Enough of that. Yeah, you're right, though. MBS is married, so I wonder yeah. how that's going to work out. I guess he can... I. Well, technically speaking, can't they have multiple wives? So I guess I don't that's know okay. about I don't know about the royal family because I don't think that I might be wrong about this. I should know this. I don't think that the royal family guys usually have multiple wives. Mm. Maybe I'm I might be completely wrong about this. We need to look it up. So there's that MBS Lohan relationship. Lindsay Ben Salman. <laughs> Lindsay Ben Salman. Uh, final note. So I saw. Spider-Man movie. Yeah. And into the Spider-Verse. Into the Spider-Verse. It's on Netflix now. I haven't I don't watch superhero movies that much. I love them. They're they're fun when I watch them. Into the Spider-Verse was the most was the best film I've seen in a very long time. I'll it just put really it that good. way. Yeah. I think it was revolutionary. Yeah. Like the way that animation took it was just incredible animation incredible voice acting incredible story awesome um, story yeah so funny such a good character really good pacing yeah really good pacing uh really great origin story i don't just i was blown away that movie came out like last year and i was like whoa this thing existed for a year and i haven't seen it it checks off a whole lot of boxes and i, I really like that there's like a um kind of like a a really good like minority superhero um, and it, like the, the, the story is just so easily identifiable, especially for folks that like live or grew up here in New York city. Um, it's just like really real. It wasn't, it wasn't overdone, you know, and it was, I don't know, pretty awesome. Well, here's my thing. So I don't care about like making race, like making superheroes, like a certain race just to like be politically correct. But the thing about Miles Morales is that I found him, I found him relatable just yeah, because he was a really real. Yeah. Yeah. Like I was just like, he doesn't need to be, he could be whatever color. He, the same, this character could be black, white, Chinese, whatever. Yeah. He, I, he, that's a really good relatable. point. I, I guess he, he's just like a very, very, he was a New Yorker through and through. Like everything about him just screams New York in a very authentic way. The fact that he was a, that he was a, uh, just with the cat, like the private school, how to wear, because I went to pri- I went to Catholic school. Mm-hmm. Um, to wear a stupid uniform. Yeah, how to wear a stupid uniform. I just thought it was, he could have been any color. Uh, and I heard that that, I was looking, I was like doing my research on it after I saw it. And I heard it was like controversial when it came out. Mm-hmm. And yeah. I hate this argument of people getting like offended when, there's like when they, they, assume, the that, they, assume, they, of they assume that everything is like some type of conspiracy to be super politically correct. Right. Why don't you just take it for what it is and stop caring about right. like it was a good movie doing it and just appreciate the actual movie or not. Like, all right. So Spider-Man's protege is black and Spanish. Well, he's black and Hispanic, right? He's a mixed black, kid, which black. is why I identified with him because I was like, yes. Just a, just mixed like a story. Superhero. <laughs> just like a story. I don't care about the whatever race they are, but just the story was good. That's because all, all the superheroes stuff. are your race, dude. That's why. <laughs> I like some... I love Blade. Blade is dope. And they're remaking that, by the way. Blade was my favorite growing up. Yeah. I watched the Blade movies like 25 times each obsessed with them so i yeah, identified as a black man awesome, when man. i was younger <laughs> as a black vampire slayer that's what i, I like yeah <laughs> blade and i liked uh i sound like such a douchebag be like well i uh, like this one i like the black superhero once <laughs> i actually really love uh black panther no joke like i haven't seen t'challa holy shit those are really fun movies like he's dope. And I also think that his costume is like the coolest out of all of them. Like next to Iron Man or like War Machine, he's got the coolest, coolest looking costume. I haven't seen I haven't seen that yet. It's really good, dude. It's really good. But all right, here's an example. You don't like have to like Finn from Star Wars because he's black. Yeah. Finn from Star Wars is a terrible character. I'll just say you, it right. You don't now. like Finn? I liked Finn. Uh, I thought he I thought it was funny. First season first season. First movie, I thought he was fine. The second movie, they made him into the dumbest idiot ever, and I was like, they just made this character a useless. Like he doesn't, he they should he should have been killed off in the first movie to add to the dramatics. But they need a love interest. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. But now he has a new love interest, so 
Yeah. All right. I think we should wrap this one up. Yep. Because I have to pee again. All right, everyone. <laughs> thank you guys so much for joining another episode. Uh, we have a lot of stuff in the pipeline planned. So be excited. A lot of cool stuff. A lot of exciting announcements that will be revealed throughout the week. Uh, make sure that you rate and review the show. That's number way to number number way. That's a number, number way to help us. That's one. the number way to support us. That's the number one way to support us as of right now. And uh, Danny, any last words? Nah, man. Just keep chilling. All right, peace, guys. See ya.